Connects and a little bit more about Connects a little later. Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us this morning in the United States and in the afternoon in Israel. Uh, the goal of our program today is to feature Israeli digital health innovation and learn how Sheba Medical Center is deploying technology to address the outbreak and encourage telemedicine in Israeli society, and I would suggest beyond. I want to thank our partners, the Consul General of Israel to the Southeast, the Government of Israel Economic Mission to North America, the Israel Export Institute, and Sheba Medical Center uh, for uh, partnering and sponsoring this virtual event. Uh, I would ask if everybody could mute. Uh, therefore, there won't be any background noise. Uh, so that uh, we can hear everyone clearly uh, and not have to take pauses. Uh, for your information, Connects is a almost 30-year-old uh, economic development engine that connects Americans and Israelis in business in six Southeast states, North and, Cal North and South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, and Mississippi. Uh, we believe we've been involved with over $4 billion dollars worth of economic uh, transactions and activity. Um, we believe we bring great support in delivering value to Israeli companies seeking market entry in the Southeast United States and to American companies looking for uh, innovation, technology, mergers, acquisitions, joint ventures, and alliances in Israel. Um, if you're an Israeli company and want to be in touch with us, we'd be glad to have a conversation with you. If you have American clients, customers, friends, relatives, uh, and are aware of companies that might be interested in uh, Connects, working with them to uh, source uh, innovation in Israel, we'd be glad to work with you. Our agenda for today is uh, packed, so uh, uh, just to review with you, uh, we'll have greetings from some of our partners. Uh, we'll have a keynote from Professor Eyal Lashem, Director of Tropical Diseases at the Sheba Medical Center School of Medicine. Uh, we'll have four company, Israeli company presentations, Hiro, Adoro, My Home Doc, and Oxitone. Uh, and then uh, instead of uh, fielding questions from a very large audience, we're going to break up into different Zoom rooms. And I'll give you uh, instructions a little bit later on about that. Uh, where you're able to uh, probably in a more intimate way ask questions of each of the companies. Uh, Josh Berliner from the Economic Mission will post uh, the Zoom links in the chat room and you'll be able to go to uh, uh, a company or multiple companies as you see fit to be able to ask questions and have a more intimate discussion with the Israeli companies who are uh, uh, participating today. So uh, please, um, uh, once again, mute your uh, Zoom connection. Uh, and we're going to begin our program today uh, with greetings from Consul General Anad Sultan Dadan, uh, the Consul General of Israel to the Southeast, uh, a great partner of ours. She just celebrated her first year uh, in, in Atlanta. And uh, I'd like to call on the Consul General for her remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Barry. So happy to be to be with you all uh, here this morning. Indeed, one year in Atlanta, and this is far from what I imagined things would look like um, one year into um, into my role here. But I have to say that uh, despite the evident challenges for all of us, um, this uh, um, unprecedented situation that we find ourselves in provides also opportunities for exploring where we can further um, enhance and deepen the relationship and the partnership uh, between Israel and the United States and uh, between Israel and uh, this region in the Southeast. Uh, Sheba Medical Center is a um, has not only been recognized as um, one of the top, top 10 um, hospitals in the world. Um, it is um, 
a leader in many ways in the in technology and in what Israel is about, because Israel is often referred to as the startup nation. And uh, I'm sure that uh, um, we will see that also um, as presented by the companies participating today. But more and more, Israel is also referred to as the impact, impact nation. Um, because of the harnessing of that startup scene and the technologies, um, for addressing a global challenges, such as the one that we find ourselves in. And so um, I'm looking forward, of course, to hearing from uh, Professor Eyal Leshem, but also uh, to uh, learning about what these four companies do, because to a large extent, uh, COVID will be over, um, hopefully uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, but many of the technologies uh, will be, of course, here to stay uh, in the future and shape a, a different uh, medical field for all of us. So looking forward to the conversation today. And thank you for um, uh, inviting me to be a part of it this morning. Thank you, Consul General. Uh, it's, we have a great partnership and have over many years working with the Consulate of Israel um, and also with our next partner, uh, Inon El Roy, Economic Minister to North America. Uh, prior to Inon starting his new duties in New York City, uh, he took the time to come and visit uh, Atlanta, Georgia and discover the South and discover uh, some of the uh, unique elements, both in terms of higher education in terms of incubators, accelerators, and in terms of corporations. Enon, welcome. Thank you for joining us today and being part of this program. Thank you, Barry. I miss the South. I miss it uh, very much, and it has been uh, clearly too long. Uh, good morning, uh, Consul General and Sultan Dadon, and thank you very much for your partnership and uh, for, to you and to your team. So hello, everybody. As uh, the coronavirus continues to spread and impact all of our lives, our thoughts are with you and with your families at this time. I also want to express our deep gratitude to all the entire healthcare community and first responders who are on the front lines working tirelessly to save lives. On behalf of the Foreign Trade Administration of the Ministry of Economy and Industry in Israel and the Israel Economic Missions globally, I would like to welcome you all and to thank you for joining these sessions. This is, these are challenging days, sharing best practices as well as strengthening bilateral bonds are now important than ever. Sheba, as uh, Consul General uh, Sultan Dodon said, is a global top 10 hospital and four companies that will be featured soon could be wonderful examples of the thousands of technology companies that you could partner with in Israel and that could help you to be more efficient, productive and uh, maybe inspired in your job. Israel operates 44 economic missions globally. These missions are non-for-profit organizations that are aimed on bringing together Israeli companies and global partners. Feel free to reach out to us from the country that you're based or the state to explore thousands of inno innovative solutions together with our partners from the consulate in Miami, Connex and the Israeli Export Institute. We will be delighted to expose you to the Israeli Innovation Fountain. Thank you so much and have an interesting and meaningful session. Mary. Thank you, Inon. Uh, I'd like to next introduce Mando Alfaza, the head of medical device and digital health sector at the Israel Export Institute. Uh, thank you very much, Barry. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our virtual event. I would like to start my speech by thanking our partners in the U.S. for their cooperation and efforts in organizing this unique event, and also thanks to the present presenters uh, joining the session from Israel. My name is Mando Alfasa, and I'm leading the medical device and digital healthcare sector of Israel Export Institute. Uh, Israel Export Institute is a not-for-profit organization uh, supported by the government of Israel and the private sector to advance the integration of uh, Israeli techs into the global market. And our department works to facilitate trade opportunities and strategic alliances uh, by performing a variety of projects and business activities in different geographies to uh, remove barriers and advance the integration of 
uh, medical device and digital healthcare companies into the global market. We are engaged uh, with more than 800 companies uh, in medical device and digital healthcare domains in a yearly basis and assisting them with the international commercializa commercialization journey. Um, today, uh, we will give you a taste of four Israeli digital healthcare companies in the areas of AI, variables and IoT, mobile healthcare and clinical workflow. To explore more companies and technologies, feel free to contact us and we will be uh, happy to make a fit for you. We wish you a pleasant time watching this session. Thank you. Thank you, Mondo. Um, and now to the uh, keynote of our program. Uh, I can tell you that Connex takes an annual healthcare uh, delegation and expedition to Israel. Uh, one of the must see visits is Sheba Medical Center. Uh, we are delighted that today we have Professor Ayal Leshem, Director of Tropical Diseases. Uh, he's also a clinical associate professor at Tel Aviv University School of Medicine. In addition, uh, Professor Leshem has a connection to Atlanta, Georgia, uh, where he has been a, a guest researcher of viral gastroenteritis uh, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and a consultant to the World Health Organization. Uh, he is a uh, leading uh, author of over 70 articles and book chapters and uh, has, fought, has traveled extensively uh, to study the issue of tropical and travel, uh, travel medicine. So uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Leshen for making the time to be with us today and uh, call on him to uh, uh, present to the group. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon from here in Shiva Medical Center in Tel Ashomer. Um, let me just see, yeah, I think my slides are showing. As you were told, I have spent a wonderful three-year period in Atlanta, living in Midtown and working for the CDC as an epidemic intelligence service. And I, we, we all still miss Atlanta a lot and uh, hope we will have a chance to go back to Atlanta in the near future. Um, and also hope you are all doing well down there. Um, so my presentation will have three very quick parts. The first will give you a brief understanding of what happened in Israel during the early stages and, uh, of the outbreak and what happens now. The second is going to talk a little bit about what Sheba did and how Sheba Medical Center responded to the outbreak. And then giving you a, um, from some slides from a different presentation to kind of let you know how Sheba utilized its capacity as a a, a tech center or a medical technology center to combat uh, COVID-19 and how you can probably collaborate with one or more of our uh, ventures. Um, so starting a little bit about, about Israel, Israel has a very unique healthcare system. For those of you not familiar with Israel, we have about 9 million inhabitants. We have a national health insurance law, which means every citizen gets a completely free acute and chronic care at, on the top medical uh, level globally. Life expectancy is number eight globally, number eight. And, uh, and uh, on the other hand, our hospitalization system is very lean, which means that, uh, that we have a lack of uh, beds and entering into the COVID crisis, we needed intensive care beds and we needed hospitalization capacity. So the first stage of the outbreak was characterized, the first wave was characterized by a very rapid response. Israel very quickly closed its borders, implemented or closed schools, implemented the quarantine on entering travelers and, and on uh, contacts, and uh, entered into complete lockdown right around the Passover for, for several days, which as you can see from this graph that was published on the CDC journal, Emerging Infectious Disease by our medical center, Israel was able to uh, reduce the number so that during May at the Nadir, we went down from seven, 800 cases a day to five cases a day. So the steps, as we mentioned, Israel is literally a geopolitical island. You have to enter through an airport, 
So we were able to close the borders from endemic countries. We were able to, on mid-March, close schools and universities, and we were able to do complete country lockdown when we were afraid that, that gatherings will increase transmission. We also had a system for mobile phone tracking so we could track contacts. And we also had um, a self, an automatic self-reporting system, which means if you came back from abroad or were in contact with a confirmed patient, you could online give your ID number and get a, a, a medical sick leave, a paid medical sick leave approval so that your employer will pay you the 14 days of quarantine as a sick leave. You didn't need to see a doctor. This was automatically downloaded and this helped many people report and go into quarantine. So we went down in May to five cases and everybody were very happy. Unfortunately, this was not the end of the story. Um, once schools opened, uh, a heat wave in end of May, early June resulted the uh, removal of the face mask, uh, mandatory face mask. Uh, weddings and mass gatherings were reopened and the beaches and we very quickly shut up back to, to about nearly 2,000 cases a day, which is where we are, where we have been for the last three or four weeks. When we look at the reasons for the second wave, we think, you know, the first reason is, you know, during the first outbreak, there were many apocalyptic predictions. People looked at New York, looked at Italy, and said, we're going to have a million patients, we're going to have 10,000 dead. None of this happened, and Israelis became very relaxed about COVID, not, not stressed, and, and many of them just said, you know, this thing only killed 300 patients, we don't need to take it very seriously. Beaches reopened, schools, we weddings were a main culprit, many people got infected in weddings, and these were closed back again a couple of weeks ago. So that's where we are right now. You see the second wave is slowing down, but certainly not disappearing. And we do anticipate several hundred cases of days to con a day to continue as long as we maintain rather normal activity and pretty concerned about what's gonna happen when schools are gonna reopen and when, when, uh, spring, when uh, fall and winter are gonna bring flu. We do have Professor Gamzo, who is now the Corona Tsar, and which created a program to collaborate with community, and we all wish for Professor Gamzo's plan to succeed. Now, as Winston Churchill said in a different context, he said, now this is not the end, not even the beginning of the end, but rather perhaps the end of the beginning. So we're now kind of at the end of the beginning of this outbreak. We changed all of our lives, and we look forward to see how this, is gonna, this event is gonna evolve and how we can learn to live with corona or perhaps dance with COVID, as Professor Gamzo said. Honing on Shiba Medical Center, for those of you who don't know Shiba, Shiba has nearly 2,000 acute hospitalization beds, 9,000 employees, conducts over 50,000 surgeries and over 10,000 births. Not much in Atlanta, uh, where, where up in the north side, I think they have 20 or 25 births in, in the large hospitals. But for Israel, it's a major number. A million and a half ambulatory visits. Sheba is really the largest hospital in the Middle East. Um, a total of over half a million hospitalization beds, a teaching hospital, and 25% of, of uh, research uh, um, uh, approvals for the institutional review boards in Israel are submitted by Shiba researchers. So certainly the largest research and uh, academic hub in Israel, medical academic. Um, Shiba had the, Shiba's vision, the Chaim Shiba Medical Center, visions have to be a leading medical center, highly reputed nationally and internationally with patient-centered care, attractive to patients, medical staff, researchers, students and investors and donors. We have a huge uh, property located right east of Tel Aviv uh, Metropolitan with a lot of space to grow. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, the largest hospital, hospital in Israel, both in terms of hospitalization beds and uh, medical uh, activity and research conducted. We were chosen uh, one of the world 10 leading hospitals. We actually went from 10th place to 9th place in 2020, and we are very proud of being one 
of the best centers, but we also consider ourselves a, a leading hospital in patient care and, and treatment, not only in research and technology, and that remains our main um, priority. As COVID uh, uh, started evolving, Shiba as a leading, as the leading center in Israel, naturally volunteered to receive the first patients and to admit them. And for that, uh, uh, the first uh, infected patients actually came from that quarantine a Diamond Princess ship that was quarantined in Japan. There were quite a few Israelis and they were flown back to Israel where they were admitted at Sheba Medical Center. So we were the first to, to have experience with COVID patients. And the first thing we understood from experience in other places is we have to surge up intensive care capacity, which is, intense, which is a unique intensive care because you have to isolate the control center and sensors from the patient care area, which is the red zone where the patients can transmit the disease. And what you see on your right is the intensive care unit that we have built. But the most amazing thing is if you look at the left, this intensive care unit was built in a parking lot. And that's how this parking lot looked six weeks earlier, less than six weeks. So within, within a month, we were able to build a, a over 300. We, we were able to increase our intensive care capacity from 86 beds to nearly 400 intensive care unit beds, all with red zones and isolated uh, uh, patient care capacity. And this attests to uh, Shiba's logistic and, and uh, uh, capacity and depth in clinical uh, capacity. And this was published in the Intensive Care Medicine Journal, one of the most prestigious journal of intensive care. Shiba was the first to build the isolated unit. Shiba was the first to say, well, psychiatric COVID patients may need an isolated facility if they need to be in patients and, and volunteered for it. And during the first wave, Shiba treated more than 30%, nearly 30% of the most severe patients, those who were mechanically ventilated, compared with all other hospitals in Israel. We, uh, um, we hosted the National Emergency Operations Center uh, so that we can collaborate with IDF te technology units, collect the epidemic intelligence and the command of, on control. All this happened at Shiba Medical Center during the first wave. We also led quite a few international collaborations, both uh, in terms of teaching and, and uh, sharing experience with other countries published in the international media. This is from the Asai Shimbun. We had quite a few in, in uh, paper uh, um, articles in the New York Times, in the Wall Street Journal, even, even in the Atlanta Journal of Constitution. Um, and uh, we also collaborated with the Palestinian doctors from the Palestinian Authority to share our experience and help them cope with the outbreak in uh, the West Bank and Gaza. And uh, as an innovation hub, one of the, the I, I will uh, refer more to this in, in the second part of my uh, presentation, but for one example is one of our young uh, orthopedic residents who used to serve in the uh, top uh, IDF intelligence uh, technological unit. And when the outbreak started, he understood that there's a lack of, of mechanical ventilators. And he rapidly called his friends as would happen in Israel, he called his friends in, in the a technology unit, and they said, let's sit together and think about something. And within weeks, we had a converter that converts non-invasive ventilator into a me full mechanical ventilation machines uh, as a, a, a fruit of this collaboration. And the end of this part, going back to Churchill, Churchill says, never let a good, said, never let a good crisis go to waste. And we at Shiba thought that the COVID would be a good opportunity to boost our technological collaboration and capacity. So moving to my second uh, uh, um, part of my presentation, I will share with you a little bit about what we call the healthcare innovation at Shiba Medical Center. And thank you for Lital Schneiderman, who's director of BizDev in Shiba. So the ARC Center stands for Accelerate, Redesign, and Collaborate. Um, we focus on digital health, open innovation, 
collaboration with, with, with leading international collaborators and, and innovation infrastructure. And so as you can see, we have uh, both corporate strategic partners, we partner with academia, with the top academic institutes in Israel. Uh, our academic affiliation is to Tel Aviv University, but our collaboration is with other, with all uh, top centers on many of them. We collaborate with startup uh, um, companies and we collaborate with international academic institute and healthcare organizations. Our hubs, and, and I will not uh, spend a lot of time because uh, I don't have a lot of time, but uh, ARC has uh, six hubs for six uh, leading fields or cutting edge fields in uh, healthcare innovation, including personalized medicine, big data, virtual reality, um, the operation, uh, operating uh, room of the future, telemedicine and rehabilitation. And once COVID outbreak started, of course, we went into what's called battle mode and, and, and uh, used all of our capacity and collaboration to come up with solutions. So as I mentioned, the first, the first uh, patients came to the isolated unit and it was highly important that we create a monitoring capacity that is separate from the red zone, which we call the teletent. We used all telemedicine devices available and all collaborations that we have at Chiba to monitor the patients. So one of the devices we used is called the Early Sense. This one is placed under the mattress and takes the vital signs of a patient that lies on bed. And we're able to monitor all signs from, from distance. Of course, we use TitoCare, which may, many of you may know, to conduct a online a physical examination. This one helps you auscultate to lungs, look to the throat and uh, to the auscultate to the heart and, and into the ears. So a lot of capacity in TitoCare collaboration. This robot called the InTouch Telepresence robot was one of the most fantastic devices. And I showed you the pictures from the intensive care, but the, the person sitting at the control tower could go with the robot to a patient that's not currently being attended by one of the nurses and doctors and check the condition. And so that when we used, you can see this robot, uh, we could send the robot to one of the beds and see what the situation is. And it really helped us a lot and still helps us at the COVID intensive care unit. Then we had the part where there was first a shortage in mechanical ventilations. And I shared with you one solution that was in collaboration with one of the IDF units, we had other solutions that we uh, developed and uh, brought into clinical testing, uh, all of them related to mechanical ventilation. And one of our highest prides is that uh, we collaborate with MD, Cl MD Clone platform so that all of the uh, electronic information in Shiba is pulled and de-identified using MD Clone specific technology so that it is really readily available for researchers and collaborators. And all of our COVID data is already available for research. We have collaborations with other schools and universities, and we conduct our own research on this data. So to finalize my part, and we are on time, it's five. I think I even brought it a few minutes earlier than, than my 20 minutes, but I think uh, uh, as I was told at the, as, at the CDC, short is beautiful. I think you get the gist of it, the capacity at Shiba and the, and the uh, amount of research technology and clinical uh, uh, work that goes on here. And, and naturally, if you would like to collaborate, we are happy. You can Google me at Shiba in contact. At, uh, you can Google my name very easily or, or connect with, uh, with the ARC Center or with uh, Lital Schneiderman, who's our biz dev. Um, over. Thank you, Professor Lesham. I just wondered, uh, we do have a few minutes for questions, uh, probably a couple. So if there's, uh, uh, if there's questions, you can put them in the chat room and I'll try to get it to at least a couple of them. And while we're waiting for questions, Dr. Lesham, I wondered if you could comment on uh, the use of face coverings, masks, shields, goggles uh, in Israel, uh, the feeling on the part of the, uh, the faculty at Sheba about the uh, utilitarianism of, of using them. Uh, certainly I've read a lot that young people in Israel tend not to like to use them. Uh, 
so I wondered if you could comment a little bit about that. Well, the science is clear. When you have a close contact with a patient or with a COVID carrier, some of them are asymptomatic, a face mask worn by the patient and by the person in close contact will substantially protect the uh, person in close contact from being infected. It's not a complete protection. There could be still infections, but from my personal experience, I have been in close contact several times with COVID patients. They were always, both of us were with face masks. These are simple surgical face masks, and I was not infected to date. My current serology is from earlier this week. So uh, I truly believe face masks are protective and should be worn, and we're talking about your old school, both nose and, and the chin and face, both by you and by the person you're in close contact, certainly in uh, medical uh, settings, in healthcare settings. Now, when the, the debate goes whether or not, you know, face masks are effective in open spaces, in long distances, in short contacts, I think face masks practically has very little uh, adverse events or side effects associated. And as long as we are in the beginning of this event, we should probably uh, think differently and protect ourselves and people close to us. It is, it is always not easy to help, uh, to help uh, younger people uh, uh, adapt uh, behavioral changes, but the, the cost, the personal cost of wearing a mask is so much lower than the cost of someone next to you being infected, certainly if they, are, if they, they belong to a risk group, uh, uh, older age or a chronic illness, you really want to protect those persons next to you. And therefore, I would highly recommend full utilization of face masks whenever you are in close contact with anyone who's not your close, fam close family. Um, and that's what we practice here at Shiba. Over. Thank you, Professor Lesham. Uh, there was a request uh, for information about the technology that you mentioned during your presentation. And uh, I know that the economic mission in New York will be sort of the central uh, uh, point for disseminating information, presentation, et cetera. So we'll make sure that uh, that, that happens. Um, since I don't have any other questions at the moment, let's, let's move ahead. I wanna thank you for taking the time. Uh, we look forward to benefiting from the uh, expertise uh, that Sheba Medical Center has and has developed during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and uh, we look forward to continuing to, uh, to collaborate and partner in the future. So now we're going to turn to company presentations, uh, and uh, we're going to start with Hiro, Hiro, which is a conversational AI uh, solution for effective triage and engagement. Uh, we're delighted to have Israel Krush, the CEO and co-founder with us to present, Israel. Thank you so much and thank you all for having us. Uh, we're really excited uh, to be here and also try to make it as short as possible uh, to give you a sense of what we do at Hiro. And um, so my name is Israel and I'm from Israel. Uh, this is my email address, so feel free. I also share it in the chat after my presentation. Um, so I'll start maybe with uh, what we've seen. So, you know, it's, it's, Everyone know that healthcare can be a bit complicated um, in routine times and especially in COVID-19 times. Uh, patients can't really find their uh, physician services, uh, scheduling appointments, etc. They have communication issues between them and their providers. Um, as mentioned, this uh, was really emphasized during the spread of COVID-19 and uh, the, the need for a scalable solution uh, to really automate some of these workflows to answer patients' questions and help them complete flows uh, was emphasized. And that's why we've created Hiro. So Hiro is a plug and play conversational AI platform for healthcare providers. And we basically deploy AI assistants, conversational AI assistants, which are chatbots or voice assistants by automatically uh, tapping into the existing data sources of the organization, such as their websites, database, APIs, EMRs, et cetera, 
um, scraping them and translating them into a knowledge graph that can be queryable via natural language. Um, at the end of the process, uh, we give the provider an embeddable piece of code that can, they can just put in their various platforms. And so just maybe to talk about, you, you probably heard about a lot of conversational AI assistants out there. Uh, the main differentiation for Hyro is really the plug and play approach. So we don't require you to create this manual workflows of if patient says X, reply with Y, and, and being based on these predefined playbooks or intents. Uh, we have an open or intentless conversation based on your data, based on your website, databases, EMRs, et cetera, by building this knowledge graph. This is an actual knowledge graph from a client of ours based on one word alone, which is neurology here in the center. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, really uh, the providers that love us is because the seamless deployment, the plug and play deployment um, and the zero maintenance it takes. So by tapping into the data sources, we constantly update the information, uh, which again uh, may be very beneficial for um, use cases such as answering frequently asked questions about COVID-19. So there is really no building platform or predefined playbooks and we can scale with you um, to other use cases or platforms as you wish and as your patients need. So this is just um, um, a quick show of how it looks from a mobile device, for example, for the patient and for the admin. And they can converse via text, via voice, um, and obviously they have some suggestions and other rich media. Um, we have also a rich conversational intelligence that is gathered. Uh, so at the end of the day, this is the first time some of our provider actually know what their patients are looking for, what is the missing uh, links for them to really complete an insightful and meaningful patient journey. Um, some stats about uh, what our clients see on average, focusing on really the conversion rate or the engagement. And I'll share this presentation with you if you'll just send me your email. Uh, so happy to. Some of the use cases around patient access, care delivery or care management, uh, the top two are really about finding uh, physicians and then scheduling appointments uh, via the website or via the call center. Today, telehealth became a big deal again, scheduling for telehealth, as well as answering frequently asked questions about everything from billing to HR to COVID-19. So if we are talking about COVID-19, we just released a free COVID-19 virtual assistant for healthcare provider and government institutions that can answer um, questions um, in natural language, like what is the coronavirus, where, where can I get tested, how do I protect myself and navigate patients to the relevant resources. It is based on the WHO and the CDC and other verified sources, including customized resources of the healthcare providers themselves. And as I mentioned, it all comes automatically without the need to really uh, focus on content curation. Um, so this is just a sneak peek uh, based on uh, thousands of conversations that we gathered from this uh, COVID-19 assistant. We released the COVID-19 report, which is also free to download on our website. Uh, so these are some of the uh, subjects that patients are asking about besides COVID-19. Um, so as you can see, telemedicine is, is on the rise, but also about donating masks, rescheduling appointments, prescription refill, et cetera. These are some of the providers we work with. Uh, we focus entirely on the US market. Um, so feel free to reach any of them and I'm happy to connect you with them. We also have our own ARC here, but unfortunately it's Austin Regional Clinic and, and not Atlanta. So we'd be happy to uh, come also to Atlanta today virtually, but work with the healthcare providers in Atlanta. And I think I'm done. Uh, so this is my email again. This is our website and we're uh, Microsoft partner and Azure partner. So we have also special offer for uh, providers who are hosted on Azure. Thank you so much. Israel, thank you. Uh, we'd love to have you in the Southeast, not only Atlanta, but in North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, and Mississippi. So we'll work hard to, uh, uh, to, ma to make that happen. Uh, I believe our next uh, company presenting is Adoro. Uh, uh, Ardoro integrates your virtual visits with your PM calendar, making telemedicine easy. Uh, we have Dikla Ronin, the COO from uh, Ardoro, uh, who will be presenting to us uh, today. Hi, 
Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sikla Reynan, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Adoro. Thank you for the opportunity to present Adoro to you. Um, I would like to start with telling you a little bit about the company. Adoro provides smart digital patient access platform. And if you wonder what does that mean, think of the Amazon website without the product information and the buy button. This is exactly what we do. We help healthcare organizations to digitize the patient experience, allowing patients to find and shop for care online, exactly the same way they would do on Amazon. We are active in the US market since 2016 and partner with the leading health systems like Tampa General Hospital, Fluke Your Physician Group, Robert Wood Johnson, and many others. Our technology is based on a deep integration with the EMR system, and we are certified by leading uh, EMRs like uh, Epic, Allscript, Athena Health, G Centricity, IDX, and many others. Um, the story starts back at 2007. Um, we started a company based on a personal need. At the time, it was my personal need. I was pregnant and I needed a doctor appointment and I couldn't get a hold of the office. Uh, therefore, we decided to develop a technology to allow patients to self-schedule. Today, um, Odoro is the Israeli market leader. We are working with all four HMOs. Um, and we were actually able to disrupt the market and today self-scheduling and, and for the patient to be able to take self-actions um, is, is a standard in Israel. We we're also able to achieve the amazing number of 42% of appointments that are self-scheduled. Uh, just to give you a sense, in the US, the number is around 5% and I hope that I can answer uh, why is the reason for that uh, later on. Um, so, I don't know if you know, but 93% of patients demand digital access. Uh, this is a recent uh, uh, survey by, uh, by that book. Um, we also know that if you're using digital patient access platform, uh, healthcare, can expect, healthcare system can expect a proven ROI. Uh, you can expect to acquire new patients to balance the provider's workload to reduce uh, no-shows, and in general, to improve both the patient experience and the business outcomes. Uh, I'll show you in a minute how we did that during uh, COVID to help our, uh, our organizations. Um, but, and this is a, a big but, it's very hard, it's, it's important to choose a, a, a system that is flexible and agile so it can accommodate the ongoing changes of uh, health systems, as you probably know better than me, um, everything changed all the time and the COVID was a perfect example for that. So when COVID started in around March, there was uh, um, recommendations to stop all online scheduling immediately because all of the workflows changed and nobody was able to accommodate all the changes. That was, um, you know, that was the, the, the day when we got phone calls from our customers asking for help. And, um, and what we were able to do for our customers was to, first, everybody geared up with a telehealth solution, right? So not, mo most of them didn't have it before. But when they start using the telehealth solution, they realize that it's not enough. And they asked for help uh, with the rest of the processes that needs to be done in order to, uh, to address the patient's needs. So immediately we were able to add the uh, patient screening. So now if you are scheduling online, you first have to go through the patient screening and, uh, and answer all the COVID questions. Um, we were also able to uh, um, allow the patient uh, sign the consent forms online and also collected the, the copay. Now, um, everything changed and the patients were asking for, uh, for the information. So, we're, so we used our messaging and reminder systems to, uh, to communicate all of the changes uh, as it happened. So today the uh, dental is closed and tomorrow uh, a different department will be closed, etc. So the agility of the system was the most important thing and, and the reason why we were able to grow even during the pandemic. 
And I think that the results speak for themselves. Working on this presentation, I took a look at our analytic dashboards to pull out some information. And I saw that uh, one of our customer, a group of over 500 uh, providers were able to gain 90% adoption for their self-registration uh, module. And that happened within a week. Another customer were able to gain 34% of new patient scheduling within two weeks. So it's super important now when you have to uh, rebuild the, the patient volume. And for most of our patients, we see that 50% of the appointments are, are self-scheduled after hours. Uh, I think that this is demonstrate how much these tools are well accepted. And now it's not a question of why anymore, it's a question of when, because it's obvious to everybody that uh, remote access and self-actions are a must in the new era. I'm happy to take questions in the, in the Q&A session after the uh, presentation, and thank you again for having me. Nicola, thank you so very much. Uh, you. Having tried to get an appointment with Apple, maybe after healthcare, you should move into the technology, consumer technology. Uh, arena, I think they could use your technology. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I just want to remind everybody in the chat room, there are Zoom links uh, so that you can continue a dialogue with uh, our uh, guest companies today. Um, uh, my home doc will be next. We'll stay on this Zoom link, but there are three other Zoom links for Hyro, Adoro, and Oxytone. So uh, please take note of that and uh, it'll provide an opportunity for you to ask all the questions you want in dialogue uh, with our Israeli companies, uh, which is an important feature of this uh, virtual event. So next is my home doc. Uh, I can say that I've had the opportunity to meet with uh, Shabtai Negri, the CEO, uh, during a delegation visit uh, to Israel in December. We were very impressed. Uh, we would like to bring my home doc to the Southeast to all sorts of healthcare delegations. I know Emory's on the, online today, Emory Healthcare. I know UAB Health System, University of Alabama Health Systems online and, and likely others. So uh, I'd like to call on um, Liat Haddad, the business development manager for uh, my home doc to present. Hi, hello everyone. Um, I'm, thank you for the opportunity to meet with you all. Uh, my name is Liat Haddad. I'm the VP of Business Development uh, of Sanara Ventures. And I, we also work uh, very closely with My Home Doc, which is one of our companies here at Sanara Ventures. Um, uh, our device, what My Home Doc does is remote patient monitoring. Uh, this is a device that allows you to take measurements of nine uh, physi physiological parameters. You, have the, you see the device here. Uh, the upper part is this, our stethoscope, uh, which allows you to hear the heart, lungs, and abdomen sounds. You have the otoscope here, allowing you to, to examine the ear canal and the eardrum. You have an IR thermometer. Um, uh, enabling the, sorry, uh, taking body temperature. And um, you have the pulse oximeter here um, for uh, saturation level and heart rate. And using the smartphone camera, you can take images of the skin, the mouth and the throat and um, send to the doctors. So altogether, we, use, we utilize four sensors that are used to uh, provide these uh, parameters and, um, and um, uh, the attachment is um, to, the, to the smartphone and it's done uh, like this. I don't know if you can see everything, but it is a device that you mount on the, uh, on the smartphone and this is uh, how you use um, the smartphone to, to provide this, uh, the indication as to these param par various parameters. Uh, the, the device includes three uh, components. The first one is the device, 
the hardware that you attach to the smartphone. The second is a mobile application that is very um, easy to use and is very self-explanatory. Uh, it it uh, presents all nine parameters and the user uh, chooses one by one, performs the exam and uploads to the uh, cloud. Uh, we have two modes of action. The first one is the synchronous one, an online mode, which you contact the doctor and perform the exams together with him online through a video, a video chat. The, and the physician will review all the results and instruct the patient what to do, whether it is to uh, go to the ER or a clinic or just uh, stay at home. Uh, the other mode is the asynchronous mode in which the patient uh, examines himself and uploads uh, to the cloud. The physician will enter a data room, examine all the parameters, and send the feedback to the uh, patient. So the main advantages of, the de of our device is, uh, first of all, uh, the ease of use. We think it's uh, very easy to operate. It's uh, just having one uh, unified device that is very um, uh, simply attaches to the phone, which is also very familiar to the users, and makes the whole process of self-examination and remote patient monitoring very um, easy and familiar. And we are compatible with the iOS and Android uh, operating systems. Um, the the uh, product was designed with uh, the thought of the need for integration. So it was designed with the open architecture, allowing to uh, integrate very easily, very seamlessly. We have an API and an SDK depending on our partner needs. So uh, we are already working with a uh, number of partners and we see that uh, the integration and the integration is um, uh, not uh, very um, uh, complicated and complex. And um, the main thing that we hear from the market is that the very competitive price. We aim to a price of under 100 uh, US dollars, making this, this uh, device very affordable and very um, uh, competitive. Uh, in terms of uh, our business models, we are extremely uh, flexible. We take into account that this will uh, require a services model, basically, um, and we uh, will um, uh, adjust the business model to our partner. We're um, uh, talking about a uh, sale of a hardware plus a service, um, a service model. We will have probably a subscription an annual subscription or, or a monthly subscription. And we do see, we are in touch with many uh, players in the market and some of them utilize um, uh, different models such as leasing uh, models or, uh, or um, service only. So we are open to such, um, to such uh, possibilities. And uh, we see that, that the market uh, is already very uh, interested. Uh, the my home doc status uh, um, current uh, current status is uh, we just received um, a mal clearance uh, this week, uh, so this is uh, some uh, very significant progress we made this week. We are getting re ready to submit to the uh, CE and FDA within the next uh, couple of weeks, and expect the approvals due to the. Um, uh, changes in the process of regulatory uh, in, in these current, current days of COVID-19, we uh, were promised that the no notified body and the approval bodies in, uh, in the U.S. Are, uh, will be more lenient, so we expect the process to be uh, faster than, than, uh, the, than the usual. We expect uh, the clearances um, early next year. Uh, we are working in Israel with all uh, four HMOs and uh, three uh, strategic partners. Uh, we are in the stages of uh, mini pilots with the HMOs and our strategic partners to see how it works and um, 
to see how it works and how uh, the, the end consumers are receiving the product. We have a lot of clinical work done in Israel. We received a, a Corona grant from the Israeli Innovation Authority lately, and we are planning um, clinical trial for Corona patients in Bellingson hospitals. We also have three pilots um, that are also backed by the Israel Innovation Authority, um, checking the validating the sensors and also the the usability aspect of the product. And uh, we have um, a lot of traction, a lot of global traction. We have a pilot agreement in place with one of the U.S.'s biggest retailers, and we have. Uh, a partnership in place in Japan. And um, in addition to that, we have uh, a lot of talks with uh, dis many distributors in Europe, uh, insurers in the US and uh, Europe and Asia, um, and also some um, uh, hospital groups in different places. So there's a lot of progress done uh, these days. We are expected to, to be able to manufactures um, uh, tens of, uh, tens of uh, thousands of units um, by the year end. So full commercialization after the clinical work and uh, all the uh, pilots that are done here and abroad uh, early next year. Uh, that's it. I would also uh, welcome any questions that you have uh, in the room later on. Great, thank you, thank you, Liat. Uh, uh, I know that uh, uh, that uh, home doc, my home doc, captured the imagination of the physicians that were on our delegation, and uh, we look forward to working with you to to bring you to the southeast. So uh, thank you again, and thank I you. look forward I look forward to moderating uh, the Q and A period with you. Uh, Excellent, thank you very much. The program. Next is Oxytone Leon Eisen, the CEO and co-founder. Oxytone is the continuous monitoring for effort, effortless medical follow-up. I had a conversation this week with the seventh largest hospital system in the United States, which is now Atrium Navicent, covering North and South Carolina, uh, Central and South Georgia, and Northwest Georgia. Uh, this is something that I think would be of particular interest to them. Uh, they bemoan the fact that following up with patients is difficult. Uh, and uh, uh, this is something that uh, certainly would be of interest to them. So Leon, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, thank you for all. So I would like to start from the word uh, that uh, everything changes in a fundamental way and that to follow these changes is inevitable. So in Oxytone, we uh, manage easy and fast access to continuous physiological data and predict it inside whenever you need it. So the main problem that COVID-19 just uh, revealed that top 5% of chronic patients that account about 50% of all our healthcare expenses, they don't have real uh, benefits from healthcare today. No monitoring benefits. So all devices, everything what we build is dedicated for some average patient, not high risk patient. And just take into account all these nursing home, what happens there. So we are unequipped, totally unequipped with something that could help patients who, who cannot help by themselves. So and this is an urgent problem, and they all need continuous monitoring because remote care based on uh, just fragmented care, focusing on a moment in time, create false alert, and just has lack of communication with chronic disease patients. So in Oxytone, what we're doing? What we're doing in Oxytone? We use connected wearable medical devices. We use secure, continuous physical measurements or continuous uh, home monitoring and personalized data analytics. So we detect, predict, and avoid rapid disease alteration and thereby empower proactive care of people with, with really chronic comple complex diseases so they can live a healthier life. So where we land our customers? 
So in Occitan, uh, what we do, we deliver information in such a way that it makes easy and timely for clinicians to make difficult decisions. And actually, this decision should ensure the best clinical outcomes. So we, it means that we deliver information in such a way that it just trigger actionable uh, answers and trigger very critical decisions at the same time while removing noisy and excessive data. So normal patient uh, in, the process of, in the process of remote care uh, cannot, normal patient is okay, but if patient is really high risk patient, normal process of remote care doesn't work and makes life of this patient critical. So for example, if we will take pulmonary disease patients, right? Normal pulmonary disease patient is very much involved in, in his uh, uh, healthcare management. But if this patient is very elderly, patient high risk, he cannot put up with all technology, with all active measurements, all this stuff. They need totally passive monitoring. They want to spend time with, with their uh, kids and grandkids, not with, uh, with illness. So this is where we are. And actually we're focusing on uh, this area. We start from ferroteptic area, fer uh, area in pulmonary diseases that COVID-19 in, is included. And all our technology was developed specifically to identify and help patients with acute respiratory failure. And this is the most important outcome of COVID-19. So how we do this? So workflow is very easy and straightforward. That at the same time enables to upgrade healthcare processes of our customers. We capture precision data. We capture clinical data points by very, very comfortable way. We process and analyze this data point and we enable to trigger uh, some uh, uh, care plan and some uh, intervention if something happens with the patient. So how we do this? Actually, as you know, today we have a lot of uh, spot check monitors, pulse oximeters, blood pressures. That's okay again for average patient, but for high risk patient, we have to deliver continuous monitoring. And pulse oximetry, for example, has 50 years of experience in the market. It gives you a very good picture. You like this picture. Everybody uses this picture, but it's not a wonderful picture because this picture is taking once a day, once a week, week, and doesn't deliver you whole day to that. You need to decide for high risk patient. His, uh, his uh, condition could change within the hour. How you know what happens? So we lose opportunity to help this patient. And this is what we saw in our clinical trials, by, by the way. So we developed, and this is our flagman device, uh, very unique technology. So pulse oximetry at Ulna Bone. It has FDA clearance, World Fjords in 2017. It has C uh, certification. It has all ISO and security issues. And they generate the main vital signs. So it's a medical device. If compared to Fitbit, physician could prescribe based on these data. So what physician could have in real time if physician wanna have it? SPO2, heart rate, pulse rate, variability, skin temperature, symptoms accessory uh, assessment, respiration rate and activity. So taking uh, all these through analytic engine and artificial intelligence engine, engine we offer, we call it, uh, disease specific uh, uh, report. That report, report just generates hypoxia index change, sleep apnea index change. So physician know exactly what happened with respect to what happened to patient yesterday or one hour ago and could predict what happened in future. We generate smart notification based on AI and correlation of all these vital signs in real time. And finally, we're planning soon to apply for FDA for specific risk index. So what physician could unlock? 
uh, like in ICU, but just imagine this is from home. And if something happens, our algorithm just locates this problem and enables this report to trigger uh, physician and patient behavior as well. So we have very strong behavior uh, tools in, introduced into our platform. And if physician is looking for who generate, physician could generate daily report, weekly report, and have all these data and follow the patient disease in real time or offline on, on decision. So, so far, we generated more than 20 million clinical data points and we collected. We have very good utility and uh, we compare it level of comfort of our device with uh, other like Nonin and Massima and we won here actually it was published and device look like this very small on the wrist around the ulna bone all sensors and now we releasing device that is working here some patients uh, like to wear it at the arm so uh, our customers we use value-driven business models. So our customers include health system and payers. They are connected through the value model. And most important, pharmacy are all in science because they could connect, collect data out of our product. And also we offer direct uh, integration of our device into their uh, software system so they could generate their data and use them and generate their scientific reports by themselves. And we don't have any access to this data, so it's totally secure and governed by our customers. So far, I can just, we're working with all of the world, in Japan, in uh, uh, Europe, in UK, in the uh, United States, even in Chile. So, but here, the most important of our customers, it's Philips, uh, that is the uh, uh, managed CHF of our product. Clalit, we have a huge, uh, agreement with Clalit, they have about 100,000 COPD patients and where are we going to start to work with them? Currently, we manage 300 patients there, start, starting managing. We have agreement with London Sleep Center for sleep apnea monitoring and specifically for COVID, we are working with Upstate and ASCOM. And by the way, ASCOM is one of the biggest telecommunication company in Europe. And we contracted recently with ASCOM, so they use our product within their kit, specifically for COVID-19 patients. Also, we are working with nursing home. We built specific approach to nursing home. It was very difficult. They were not re uh, they were very reluctant to do anything with some um, devices, but finally we succeeded. And uh, in J Jerusalem Post, it was uh, released some uh, press release about about our success. Also, in COVID-19, what we help? We help to identify silent hypoxia in time, readmission rate, uh, re reduce readmission rate for patients with COVID. Simply just patient come to the uh, hospital. If patient is, doesn't have to, uh, to be in the hospital, take our device, go home, and data flow uh, immediately uh, to, to, to physician. To physician. Uh, we have our office in the uh, United States, in Connecticut, and office in Israel. So if uh, somebody is interested to, to, to know more about our unique technology and capabilities, benefits, and value, please welcome. Leon, thank you very much uh, for interesting and concise presentations. Uh, and we're going to, in a few minutes, invite you to uh, uh, join some Zoom uh, chat room so that you can uh, continue your conversation with each of the each of the companies. But uh, before that, I want to thank uh, Professor Leshem for joining us today and his insights about uh, uh, Sheba's innovative approach to uh, COVID-19. I want to thank our partners, the Consul General of Israel to the Southeast, the Government of Israel Economic Mission to North America, the Israel Export Institute, Sheba Medical Center, and, and my own organization connects the America Israel Business Connector. Uh, uh, we are all great partners and channels. Uh, we all complement one another and help one another uh, to further uh, the uh, activity between uh, Israel and the United States, and in particular in our interest, the Southeast United States. 
So I want to invite you to join a chat room. The links uh, are in the chat room uh, for four, uh, for three different Zoom uh, uh, connections. Uh, my home doc will remain online with the current Zoom. Uh, Tamir Rave will manage Hiro's room. Uh, uh, Roy Dahan from the consulate will manage Odoro's and Josh Berliner from the economic mission will manage Oxytones. Uh, again, thank you all for being there. Uh, Liat, stay online with me and yeah. uh, uh, we look forward to continued dialogue between uh, those in the audience and, and our Israeli companies. And uh, again, the uh, economic mission can be a terrific source of uh, information around this particular virtual event. Uh, you're welcome to contact me. You're welcome to contact the companies directly. You're welcome to contact Sheba Medical Center directly. And as always, the consulate is a tremendous resource uh, with the Consul General and with Roy Dahan. So uh, we look forward to working with you in the days and months to come. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. You're welcome. So for those of you that re remained online, and for some reason I have a picture of Josh, uh, uh, are, do any of you have questions for Liat? Comments? Uh, uh, please unmute yourself, identify yourself, and, uh, and ask away. I think I see Sylvan Scheffler, uh, Scheffler, I can't read online, but uh, is there anybody else with us? Yeah. Oh, you'll come. She's what? Oh, you'll call me. Okay, because my they're on there, but my kid daughter's in the car, so she wanted to know if they could pick her up if she was friends. Uh, yeah, we, if you could mute yourself with the personal information, that would be great. I think that was mom. Do you hear mom? <laughs> Why are we hearing mom? So, do we have any questions for Leah? Oh my God, is she not muted? No. Oh, she's on your phone? No. Am I the she's only on one here? I'm blathering. How do you hear her? Oh my God, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> Is she not muted? No. Cool. Do we have any questions? Please unmute yourself and ask Liat some questions. Liat, until yes. someone unmutes themselves and asks a question, can you can you talk about the whole issue of broadband connection? Uh, I know that in my conversation this week with Atrium Health. Uh, there are lots of uh, rural areas in Georgia and other states I know from conversation with UAB Healthcare, uh, and I know that Joan Hicks, the CIO, was online today. Uh, one of the issues for them is, uh, is broadband connection, and, uh, and can you tell me how that impacts your device and the product offering? Well, um, our device um, is uh, um, designed for remote patient monitoring. We build on uh, uh, rural areas as well as urban areas. And um, the, the connection to the device is done by, uh, at the end of, what I mean is at the end of this device, we should have a physician doc, a physician uh, Wow. Uh, side a doctor at the end of the this uh, device and we are expected to integrate to platform of uh, telemedicine platforms and um, doctors platforms such as Odor for instance that you heard before and we haven't um, um, finalized the way that uh, the the connection will be made, but this is waiting for uh, our partner, our uh, techno technological uh, platform partner uh, uh, for finalization. This is basically what we plan to do uh, for uh, rural areas, not only in the US, but in other uh, geographies as well. Okay. Uh, so Leon, it depends. Okay, there were some additional questions that came online. I'll ask them. So one is, where will the device be manufactured? And then uh, secondarily, can you differentiate how your 
uh, product is different than the product being offered by Taito Care. Yeah, sure. So first of all, we, we manufacture currently uh, uh, in Israel. We're proud to manufacture in Israel at the moment. Uh, for uh, later on, we of course are uh, checking the possibilities in China. And also we have a number of partners in uh, other places in Europe, for instance, where they uh, think that manufacturing locally for them will be a very big advantage. Uh, so we are uh, looking in the, in the options over there. Over there. Uh, naturally, the manufacturing in Asia will allow us to have the uh, lower, lowest uh, boom or uh, um, uh, costs in terms of yeah. manufacturing. Because and because we aim, yeah. and because we are uh, getting ready for- uh, Let me just try and see it. Let me just, oh there it is, there it is. Uh, no, this is not a uh, Consumer yeah, price of, an end, end user price of under, of 19, uh, 99 US dollars. So you we can't will see. Can't uh, see the chat probably need- No, no, you're not listening to me. The We're guy sorry. said it's, we are splitting hey guys, up. Guys, somebody's online having a discussion and we can hear you and you're interrupting Liat. So I would respectfully ask you to put yourself on mute. If there's a question, I understand there are issues of muting and unmuting and this is complicated because we wanted to protect the event from somebody crashing the event and causing a disturbance. So just send your email on chat. I'll be happy to ask it. Liat, I'm sorry, continue. So basically and naturally, we'll be going to Asia probably for the lowest manufacturing costs in, to uh, be able to provide this um, and uh, uh, target price of under uh, uh, under 100 US dollars. Okay. And you've asked about the differentiation. So uh, the most important thing is that these whole the whole. Um, uh, battery of exams is uh, provided by this one unified uh, device. The attachment to the smartphone, again, is very familiar and very uh, easy. Other um, uh, devices have a number of uh, parts which uh, people uh, tend to lose and have difficulties to operate. Another uh, point I, I forgot to mention before is the connectivity issue. The device, my home doc device attaches to the smartphone and works with the Bluetooth protocol, where the others work with the Wi-Fi. The Bluetooth uh, protocol is much more, much easier to work with. We do not suffer from uh, hangups and some difficulties in uh, the communication to the uh, smartphone. And uh, the last thing is, uh, of, of course, the, the open architecture that we provide this, uh, uh, we, we see from our current um, um, uh, connections and negotiations that this is something that will be shorter in time and in funds, the, the level of integration that is needed. And then the price, the market tells us that the price is a major, uh, major differentiator and the major motivation to purchase such a device. Great. There are a whole series of questions, Liat, so this is good. Yes, uh, please. A question about privacy and compliance and collection yeah. of data. Can you uh, speak to that? Yeah, uh, again, we, of course, we are a HIPAA and GDLP a compliant, so there's no problem with uh, security and privacy. I have to say that in Israel, we have uh, privacy is, of course, an issue, but the HMOs are very uh, receptive and very um, uh, are, are very welcoming to partnerships and uh, uh, access to data and the usage of data. Now, for us, we will need to uh, discuss this with again with our partners, depending on the geography and the type of partner. We do um, uh, plan on using the data of course, uh, analyze the data and um, uh, based on the triage or steerage met method according to data and then also uh, go to um, uh, population health management, uh, helping to predict outbreaks and, uh, and so on. So we do plan on using data and the access to the data 
uh, depends on the uh, type of partnership that we will achieve. For, for now, with the current HMOs, we uh, have access to data and we'll be able to use it because we do not keep the data on the mobile phone because of privacy, privacy issues and security issues. It will be uploaded to the, to the cloud and, um, and uh, we will um, access it there. Uh, next question, let me just pull it up. Uh, there was a question about how long you think the process is for FDA approval, uh, and then when would you begin selling the device? And the question is, is in what way would you sell the device? Is, this, is it anticipated the device will be paid for by the hospital system, by the individual, by insurance? So if you could comment on that. Mm, yeah, so uh, we uh, submit the FDA in two weeks time. And as I said uh, before, we have some leniency from the FDA. We had a pre-submission process and we have, we've had a lot of uh, testings done on the sensor uh, for the FDA, a lot of surveys for the FDA, proving that the quality is a high quality of the sensors and it's as good as or better than um, um, in-use devices. Uh, we have uh, some clinical data that we provided to the FDA and usability studies. So we feel pretty comfortable uh, with our submission and we are in touch with uh, the people over there uh, and we are represented by Hogan Lovens in this process. They know the FDA very well and they know the digital dynamics very well. So we think, we think and we hope that it would take um, uh, about um, five to six months. Yeah. And uh, regarding the, um, the, the method of selling, um, as I said, we have, we now uh, meet the market annually and the traction level is very high and we meet different uh, partners. So basically we are very aware of the CPT codes for digital health and we hope for the reforms to work, uh, to work um, uh, in our favor. But for now, we are, discuss we are in discussions with uh, uh, telemedicine platforms um, and, and with hospitals that are talking about, talking about uh, and insurers providing the device to their uh, insured uh, uh, people. In, in the HMOs in Israel, the idea is to sell it to the HMO, to the healthcare organization, and they will uh, provide it to the, to, their, to the patients, to just uh, regular people. Um, and then we are also exploring uh, the retailer side which is also very possible. We are in touch with a, a very big uh, retailer in the US that is supposed to just uh, sell it to end, end consumers and we'll, uh, we'll do it that way. Um, I have to say that we are now uh, starting this uh, commercialization process and um, we are still learning what is uh, needed uh, on, both, uh, on both ends and uh, I think eventually we will go with uh, the, the uh, model of hardware and services for those who can uh, offer these services, like a telemedicine platform that can offer this, these uh, services. And uh, what I mean is mainly uh, services and less the hardware uh, factor in, the, in this whole uh, process. So. Leon, Leon, our board member in Huntsville, Gadi Shapiro, has some questions. Gadi, I'm trying to unmute you, but it's difficult. So uh, you, I apologize. You did, you did it. You did I it. did it. Okay, great. So <laughs> why don't you ask your question? Yeah, Leon, thank you for the presentation. Uh, so you mentioned uh, uh, something about open architecture. And I wonder uh, what are you planning as far as expanding your sensor capability, additional testing, because uh, you, uh, 
uh, instrument is right now pretty basic. Uh, and there, are, there is a lot, if, especially if you are talking about rural areas, if yeah. you want to get more information. So there is a lot of uh, space for expansion, either on the device itself or a, as an additional uh, system that will uh, connect to this. So yeah, can you tell yeah. Us we definitely, we definitely agree, and we're working on. Uh, uh, future additions to the device. The first one, again, we listen to the market. The first one would be uh, blood pressure. Uh, we hear the need, and uh, we also approach elderly and assisted livings. It's it's very much necessary over there, and we're working on adding another sensor. Uh, the next one will be ECG, which is also something that the market uh, requires again and again. So the work. Uh, on that already started. And the next one we are interested in is uh, mental stress. But this we'll, uh, we'll touch on uh, early next year. So these are the three we are working towards right now. And the other side that is, uh, it gets a lot of attention here on our end is the, the data. So we're working to um, uh, enhance the value on the data side as well. Uh, we are aware that, that um, the device needs to, uh, enhancements in terms of sensors, and uh, we are working as uh, much as possible, as quickly as possible to add those sensors, yeah. Are you looking into blood tests as well? Yeah, uh, yeah, we, we're looking into that. The concrete uh, plan is uh, uh, blood pressure and ECG for now. No, blood we're looking test. into many Many additions, such as uh, blood tests, yeah. yeah. Selvin, I think I unmuted you. You can ask your question. I would, no, I just wanted to hear, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, I'm not thank in you. your world, I'm in the finance world. So just to, <laughs> for, um, just for, uh, so that everybody should know. Um, I know about this, I know about the RPM world. Um, Tell me, where do you fit in? Where does the reimbursing issue fit in? Where do you know about what, uh, what how your product, the product will be reimbursed? What's the reimbursing? Um, yeah, well, um, we are aware, of course, of the reimbursement uh, issue. We uh, currently, there are a few codes dealing with uh, digital, uh, with telehealth. Right. Um, the thing is, uh, you, you, you come from the financial world and the uh, world, and the question is totally uh, fair. Uh, the thing is, uh, using a device with a telehealth is not yet uh, completely solved. But with these uh, current reforms in the US, we do expect for it to be um, so resolved uh, sometime soon. And we can work around the CPT codes that are also already available. I hear what you're saying. That's there key. is a, yeah, there is an issue there. But I think with uh, what COVID-19 brought about, I think we're doing very, very well, even with the um, uh, lack of a full, very lucrative reimbursement code. Well, as you know, the um, the president just they just signed an executive order um, having to do with yep. reimbursement, as you are, I'm sure, are aware. Right. So you could fall underneath that. Um, you could slip right. underneath very right. which, we, which I think Definitely. is going. Yeah, you know, which I think will take place. And uh, thanks, thank you very much. A very interesting presentation, and uh, um, hope you. to be hope to be in touch with you. Right. Thank thanks you very so much. much. Uh, are there any other questions? I have none in the chat room at the moment. Rania, go ahead. Hi. Do you have a question for Liat? Apparently not. Are there any other questions? Uh, for those of you just joining us, and I think some of you are joining us, 
If you have questions, you're welcome to write them in the chat room and I'll be happy to ask them of Liat. Sylvan, if you could mute yourself again, because there's a little background noise. Apologize to you, I will do that right now. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, there was a question about WhatsApp and email about being able to send stuff uh, in that way. Is there, uh, Liat, is there any comment about that? I'm sorry, can you please repeat? About sending data by email or WhatsApp. I think that, uh, yeah, that's the way it will be done, by email for sure, we, we build on that. Um, and uh, WhatsApp, I, I, uh, we should, um, I don't want to say something that is not uh, accurate. I can look into that and uh, let you know. Okay, I, great. I, uh, Barry, I do see a question here. Uh, what are your, are your capital needs? Oh, go yeah. ahead. That's an important one. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but I, I have good news. <laughs> Basically, we are now raising and seeing very good traction uh, for $3 million uh, initially um, in a safe mechanism. And then uh, we will be expanding this round to $10 million in total uh, right after the FDA submission, FDA uh, approval. So, but there is a lot of traction. We have, we see a lot of interest. The initial round of uh, almost $3 million is uh, um, almost finalized and we are interested in the bigger round. If anyone is interested, then um, it will be possible. And in your discussions with potential partners and channels, um, have they indicated that they might have an interest in investment, not just, uh, you know, partnering yes, yes. with you on the service? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. But uh, my background is venture capital, so I, I don't want to say, you know, it's not. No, no, I understand. But no, but, but I, yes, there's a, there's a great level of interest and we meet with them uh, again and again and uh, we are uh, having demonstration and demonstrations and mini pilots, so it looks good. It looks okay. good. Some of the people that are uh, that are taking part that are participating in this um, uh, smaller round will uh, be taking part in the uh, bigger round, and okay. uh, we think we are in a pretty good situation. Yeah. Oh, that's excellent, excellent, excellent. Any other questions? Uh, oh, so here's a question. Um, there's a device in the U.S. that is an otoscope that can differentiate between viral and bacterial infections that would might be a good addition to what you're doing. Is that something that's being considered or is this an idea you would consider? Defi definitely, part of what I'm doing is um, meeting uh, uh, different kind of uh, uh, companies and entrepreneurs uh, trying to merge and shorten the timeframes and really provide the market with something that is more robust and uh, more interesting. So definitely, yeah. And, and would your product have to be adapted for the use with children? Uh, no, it is uh, for, uh, for children. We are basically, uh, our, the pediatrics, uh, pediatric uh, physician will be our first uh, target. So okay. It is mainly for children and also uh, the elderly. Okay. And when there's a pandemic. <laughs> yes. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, by the way, people are also welcome to go to the other Zoom rooms. I don't want to chase you away, but if you have questions for the other companies, you're welcome to do so. Uh, Liad, I'm not going to keep you online forever. So uh, uh, is there anybody else that has a question? Liat, do you see any others? I don't see any other mess, uh, questions yet. Uh, no, I don't see any other questions. Okay. Well, I personally look forward to working with you. I think that uh, 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 my home doc is something with, that has great interest in the Southeast US. So you'll be hearing from me, uh, hopefully in the coming weeks and months. And uh, 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 thank you for taking the time, and uh, sure. uh, we look forward to uh, to working with you. Gladly. Okay. Take care. Thank everybody. you very much, everyone. Thank you so Take much. Care.
Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.